And now, today's sermon by Pastor John Hagee, The Theology of the Titanic. Will you please stand for the reading of the Word of God? Turn with me to the book of Psalms, the 107th chapter, and the 23rd verse. Psalms 107. On this day, April the 15th, 100 years ago, the unsinkable Titanic sank in the freezing waters of the Atlantic, taking 1,522 souls into eternity. What is it about this tragedy that captures our hearts and minds with such horror a hundred years later? A ship so grand and so strong, sinking on its maiden voyage in waters that were so cold and so deep, the impossible happened. The two spotters on the crow's nest had no binoculars and stared blindly into the thick fog. Suddenly they saw the massive, deadly iceberg ahead. They screamed a warning. The engines were reversed. The watertight compartments were instantly closed. Engineers have stated that had they hit the iceberg head on, the Titanic would have survived. But by sideswiping the iceberg and turning to the left, the iceberg split the right side of the Titanic with a mortal wound that was 300 feet in length as the massive ship began to nose over. The reality was that death had climbed on board the Titanic. As the orchestra played, as the people leaped overboard screaming to their deaths in the icy waters of the Atlantic, as the Marconi Wireless sent out its signal to the very end, as Captain Smith stood at his post until he drowned, as the first-class passengers scrambled aboard the lifeboats while passengers in the second and third class were drowning. It took two hours and 40 minutes for this wonder ship of engineering, this ship of power, of grace, of beauty, to rip apart and plunged to the bottom of the Atlantic Ocean. The Titanic was called in the newspapers on both sides of the Atlantic, the Wonder Ship, the Millionaire Special, celebrating its maiden voyage with the world's richest people aboard. Their names were the Who's Who of Wall Street. The richest family in America was represented by the Astors, the Strauss family, the Guggenheims, and the unsinkable Molly Brown. J.P. Morgan canceled his reservations due to illness at the last minute. The Titanic was 900 feet long and the equivalent of 11 stories high. It carried 6,000 tons of coal to feed 159 boilers that propelled this mountain of steel at 25 knots through the icy waters. The smokestack was wide enough to drive two locomotives side by side with room to spare. This wonder ship was reported by the press as absolutely unsinkable, and one said, quote, even God can't sink this ship, end of quote. There are spiritual lessons to be learned from this tragic voice that America and people in this room and the millions watching by television must learn or face a greater disaster as a nation and as a people than the tragedy of the Titanic. Read with me Psalms 107 and 23 following, and let's explore the theology of the Titanic. Read, those who go down to the sea in ships, who do business on great waters, they see the works of the Lord and his wonders in the deep. For he commands and raises the stormy wind, which lifts up the waves of the water. They mount up to the heavens, and they go down again to the depths. Their soul melts because of trouble. Father, let us hear the word of the Lord today, and know that you are God and there is none like you, that you are from everlasting to everlasting, and you will have the last word. In Jesus' name we pray and ask it. And all of God's children said, praise the Lord. 
You may be seated. Examine first the name Titanic. The very name Titanic was an arrogant mockery toward the sovereignty of God. In mythology, the Titans were a race of people who fought over the forces of nature and they lost that war with God and they were cast into hell. The name Titanic was in favor of the Titans, those who fought against God and lost. The captain of the Carpathia, the ship that picked up the Titanic survivors, researched the meaning of the name Titanic, and he said, quote, Weren't we tempting God? This was a sailor, not a preacher. Weren't we tempting God? God. The name Titanic was man's fist in the face of God. The Titanic was an expression of absolute arrogance, defiance, and pompous pride. James, the fourth chapter in the sixth verse says, God resists the proud. Say that with me. God resists the proud. The Bible says, pride goeth before fall. Proverbs 6.17 says, six things God hates. The number one thing on God's hate list is a proud look. Win Wade, author of the book, The Titanic, an historical masterpiece, writes, and I quote, The Titanic was the incarnation of man's arrogance in equating size with security. His pride in intellectual mastery and his superstitious faith in materialism. End of quote. Hear it again. Pride goeth before a fall. When a man steals, when a man lies or commits adultery, he does so because of an expression of a need. But a man infected with pride needs nothing. Nothing. Not even God. Pride is a cancer that devours the possibility of love or unity or peace in the family or in the church or in the nation. Pride can never say, I'm sorry. Pride can never say, I was wrong. Pride can never say, would you please forgive me. Pride turns the finest fruit bitter. Pride is a cancer that destroys the soul. Pride grows in all soils like wild weeds. It needs no water. It needs no care. It consumes and destroys everything that it touches. Pride is a deadly sin that separates man from God. The portrait of pride is seen with Satan with his fist in the face of God, recorded by the pen of Isaiah saying, I will ascend to the hill of God. I will be like God. And God cast him out of heaven with a third of the angels because of his arrogant pride. He became the enemy of God, and he is your enemy, and your enemy, and your enemy, and my enemy. For the Bible says he has come to rob, to kill, and to destroy because of his arrogant pride. His choice weapon against you, 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 and me is pride. Pride is Adam and Eve eating the forbidden fruit, saying we will become like gods. They were driven by angels with flaming swords out of paradise into a world saturated with thorns and thistles and sickness and disease and suffering and heartache and death. God had created perfection for them, but they threw it aside because of pride. Pride is Nebuchadnezzar looking at his vast kingdom and saying, look what I did. God snatched from him his mind and sanity. And we see him in the next verse on his hands and knees in the fields eating grass like an ox. Think of it. A monarch reduced to a mindless ox. If you don't think God can't reduce you to nothing, look at that story. Pride is the portrait of the Pharisee in the house of God pounding his chest saying, Lord, I thank you that I'm not as other men. Pride is the basis of racism. Pride looks at another person of a different color and says, I'm better than you are. Let me tell you something. 
Don't you ever let anyone tell you you are better than or not as good than someone else. When you hear the voice of someone telling you, I'm better than you are, remember that's the very essence of pride itself. Racism lives in the church of Jesus Christ. It has no place in the house of God. We are family here. We are brothers and sisters in Christ here. We are one Lord, one faith, and one baptism. There is no white church. There is no black church, brown church, yellow church, or red church. There is only the blood-bought church of Jesus Christ, the triumphant church, the victorious church. We are the family of God. Give Him praise in the house of God. If you want to see what a monster pride can make out of you, Pride is the demon spirit that drove Hitler's war against the Jews. Hitler labeled Aryans, those who are of fair skin, blonde-haired and blue-eyed, as the sons of heaven. He said that the Jews were the killers of Christ. Hitler's officers, most of whom were baptized Christians, kissed the toe of St. Peter, who was a Jew. And then they went out and threw Jewish babies alive into the flames of the furnaces of Auschwitz because they had consciences that were seared with a hot iron. Demonic pride did that. If you hear a voice within you saying you're superior to other people, you're listening to the voice of the devil himself invade your life, and that spirit will destroy you because you and I are nothing more or less than the servants of Jesus Christ here for his glory and no other reason. On the Titanic, the second and third class passengers were locked behind steel doors even as the ship was sinking until the first class passengers had been safely put on the lifeboats. The first class had no class. The lifeboats were insufficient in number. The lifeboats were equipped to handle 65 to 70 people. Some of those lifeboats only had 12 people on board. When it was too late, the second and third class people scrambled onto the deck of the sinking Titanic like ants just before drowning in the freezing North Atlantic. Pride did that. Here's the description of the testimony by August Weinerstorm given to the U.S. Senate hearing. He said, quote, Close around us in a 200-foot circle lay a thousand souls crying, praying, yelling, screaming and doing their best to save their lives. They swam to us. They hung on the edge of our boat. The long, continuous wailing persisted, greatly disturbing everyone who was in the lifeboat. There was a continual moan of the dying for about an hour. End of quote. Pride did that. God resist the proud. Listen to me. God will sink the unsinkable. He will smash the unbreakable. He will conquer the unconquered because He is God Almighty and there is none likened to Him. And He will have the last word. Hallelujah to the Lamb of God. The Titanic, as it raced across the North Atlantic, known for its icebergs, was warned 12 times to change course, change course, change course. The problem, J. Bruce Ismay, president of the White Star Line that owned the Titanic, was urging the captain, Mr. Smith, who was making his last voyage to make this a record-breaking, headlines-capturing voyage to crush the other passenger shipping lines and to make them number one. It would mean huge profits. Every boiler was fired up on this monster ship as it sped through the darkness into the jaws of death because they refused to heed a two-word warning. Change course! 
Consider the men in the Bible who refused to hear from the voice of God change course. There is Pharaoh, the most powerful man on the face of the earth. Ten times God called him through ten plagues. Pharaoh's response was, Who is the Lord that I should obey him? As the firstborn of every home in Egypt lay dead in their beds, Pharaoh called for his chariots, and his mighty army pursued the children of Israel across the desert sands into the Red Sea. He pursued the Jewish people into the walls of water, and they collapsed. And the mightiest man on earth and the mightiest army was transformed to fish food in a matter of minutes. He refused to change course. Consider Judas who sold the Son of God for 30 pieces of silver. When Judas approached Jesus to kiss him in the Garden of Eden, to identify him to the Roman soldiers so that they would know who to arrest, Jesus said to Judas, quote, Friend, why have you come? Listen to those words. Jesus knew he had betrayed him. Jesus knew he had the 30 pieces of silver on him. Friend! Why have you come? He was saying, Judas, I know why you're here. It's not too late to change course. Judas kissed and betrayed the Son of God. His tormented mind drove him to throw the money back in the faces of the Pharisees. He then went and hanged himself and plunged in the abyss of hell because he refused to change course. God resists the proud. Period. Mr. Lady, young man, young lady, have you heard the voice of God calling you to change course? Change course! Change course! He knows what you're doing. He knows what you've done. He knows what you're saying. He knows what you're thinking. He knows what you're planning. Nothing is hidden from God. He says to him that knoweth to do right and doeth it not, To him it is sin. Change course. Change course. Change course. When you do not, the voice of God comes again saying, The wages of sin is death. The wages of sin is death. Listen not to an SOS signal from the Titanic but a signal that comes straight from the Holy Spirit from the throne of heaven. Quote, what shall it profit a man if he gains the world and loses his own soul? Change course. Change course. America must change course. America must change course. America must change course. We are going the wrong direction. Our forefathers built a nation. With the motto on every coin and every dollar, in God we trust. It was a moral society built on the Word of God. George Washington, the father of our country, said, quote, It would be impossible to rule the nation without the Bible. That certainly is not the opinion of Washington, D.C. More than 200 years ago, Edward Gibbons wrote one of the greatest classics of history. It is called the rise and the fall of the Roman Empire. For 20 years, Gibbon studied the Roman Empire trying to discover how an empire so great, so colossal, so magnificent could suddenly implode and collapse. Gibbons gives these five reasons for the fall of the Roman Empire that are classically accepted by historians. Remember, this was written 200 years ago. Can you see America in these five? The first reason was the rapid increase of divorce with the collapse of the sanctity of the home, which is the basis of society. Today, in America... Many couples live as if they were married by the Secretary of War, not the Justice of the Peace. In America, the divorce rate is over 50%. And statistically, it really doesn't matter whether you do or do not go to church. 
That is a statistic that holds true for both those who attend and do not attend, lest you drape yourself in the cloak of self-righteousness and say, not us. When our children are scattered like straw in a divorce, without the father there, without the mother there, they join gangs where they find acceptance and self-worth. Girls sell their bodies. Most gang members sell drugs. Many become addicted to drugs. Then they fill the penitentiaries, which are really nothing more than universities of crime. America is now spending billions of dollars to house children who were looking for authority and love and leadership in a home one day. We're now paying the high price of low living in America. It's time to change course. It's time to change course. It's time to emphasize the strength of the family and bring back families that live united under God. The second reason Gibbons gives for the fall of the Roman Empire is higher and higher taxes that destroyed the work ethic. Sound like America? America's debt is now larger than all of Europe's combined. The iceberg of debt is dead ahead of us. And our grandchildren are going to be paying off the debt we are now creating if we stop right now. Reason three, the mad craze for pleasure. The Romans were watching the gladiators kill each other. They were so mesmerized by the drama that was happening in the Colosseum. They did not see the corruption that was happening in government that destroyed their society. America's doing the same thing, the exact same thing right now. Reason four, the building of gigantic armaments, endless wars that led to the corruption of the economy. Let me remind you that during the Vietnam War that led to America's removal from the gold standard, our nation was in a war that lasted 11 years, and it was the responsibility of the U.S. Congress. I have said and say again, we owe an apology to every U.S. soldier we sent to Vietnam because there was not a resolution for victory from day one. But the cost of that war and other wars have weakened our economy. And now we're racing towards socialism and economic slavery. And I know some of you young people are looking at me and say, well, I'm making more money than I ever made. Yes, and you're buying less with it than you've ever bought. You don't understand that. Let me help you. When I was a college student in this town, I bought gas for 15 cents a gallon. You know what it is right now. When you can do as much with 15 cents as you can do with $4, so you're making a lot more money, but you can't buy any more with it. It's what you call monopoly money, fiat money. And it's getting worse. And it's not going to stop until you stand up and make them stop. America's becoming a nation of people now sitting at home on the couch waiting for the next government check to come. That's not how America became a great nation. We are going the wrong way, Washington. Change course! Change course! Change course! Reason number five, the attack against Christianity. When the real problem was the decadence of the people and of government. Nero set Rome on fire. That fire lasted for nine days. Thousands of people died and lost their homes. And then he blamed it on the Christians. So that the Romans would hate the Christians. Christianity in America is now under attack.
Where is the freedom of religion promised in the Constitution of the United States? Where is the fear of God? Christians of America, let us get united together on this issue of freedom of religion. Federal judges are now openly threatening to send any student to jail who prays at a school function under their jurisdiction. It's time for Congress to let us vote on these rogue federal judges or like Thomas Jefferson, defund their courts and end them. Our children are going to public schools funded by your tax dollars to hear the morals and your Christian beliefs mocked and ridiculed. We have an answer for that at Cornerstone Church. It's called Cornerstone Christian School. At Christmas, our students honor the birth of Jesus Christ. They do not celebrate a midwinter celebration. We sing at Christmas, O Holy Night, and come let us adore Him, not how green is Mother Earth. Anyone who is listening, listen to this. Your children belong to you. They do not belong to the state. They do not belong to the school district. They are your children. You claim them. You raise them in the fear and the admonition of God. I know that anyone who is openly opposed to abortion, especially on national television in America, has got to be on some kind of government watch list. So be it. I am not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ. It is the power of God unto salvation. On the Titanic, they all thought they were safe. They all thought this was the unsinkable ship. Those 12 watertight compartments guaranteed security. But the fact is, two-thirds died and one-third lived. One philosopher has said, quote, The greatest tragedy in life is to discover the thing that you believe to be absolutely true is not true at all. What if you believe that you are saved and you find out at the judgment bar you are not? Most of the Titanic believed they were absolutely safe, just as most of the 160 million church members in America feel they are safe. But are you? Let's examine the Scripture. 2 Corinthians 13.5 says, Let a man... Examine himself to see if he be of the faith. God says through Paul's pen, take an x-ray of your spiritual life and see if you don't need to change course. Listen to me. There's a difference between being religious and having a relationship with God. It's a big difference. You can master the ritual and not know the Redeemer. Pretenders are not possessors. Confession is not possession. You can talk the talk and not walk the walk. You can think you're safe and not be safe. It has been reported that America has 160 million church members. If they were truly saved, if they were truly Bible-believing Christians, America would be a far different country. Far different. No president who was rapidly pro-abortion could ever be elected to start with, certainly not re-elected. No congressman could operate a homosexual dating service out of the basement of his house and then go back home and be elected over and over again. But that happened in America. No governor could ever get elected supporting the right of men to marry men and women to marry women. But that is happening in America. If there were 160 million Bible-believing Christians in America, our high schools would not be passing out condoms with sex education. Parents would be telling the schools what they would and would not accept 
as being taught to their children. The question is, as we, as St. Paul put it, are we fighting the good fight and standing up and speaking for our cause? Or are we like blind sheep being led to the slaughter? Pastor Hagee, how can you say that the majority of church members in America may not be saved by the authority of the Word of God? Listen to this. Jesus said, not me, Jesus said in Matthew 7, 22, Many shall say unto me in that day. What day? The day of judgment. Notice the word many. That's not one here and there. Many as in the majority. Many will say unto me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name? Have we not cast out demons in your name? And in your name done wonderful works. Wonderful works means miracles. And then I will profess unto them, Depart from me, worker of iniquity. Listen to these four words. I never knew you. Jesus said that. They're talking the talk, but they're not walking the walk. Not a few will say to me on judgment day, but many That's why Jesus is saying, change course. Examine yourself. And if you find your life going the opposite direction of this sacred text here, change course. Broad is the way that leads to hell, and narrow is the way that leads to heaven, and few there be that find it. Not most, but few. Are you a Bible-believing Christian? Are you attracted to the ritual or to the Redeemer? Are you attracted to the ceremony or to Jesus Christ? What is the difference between Satan and many of America's church members? One, Satan believes the Bible, as does many church members in America. How do you know that? When Jesus and Satan were in the wilderness... Jesus was in his 40-day fast. They were having a Bible discussion. Jesus quoted the Scripture. Satan quoted the Scripture back to Jesus and twisted it. Let me tell you this. If Satan twisted Scripture with Jesus, he will twist it with you. That's why you need to know the Bible as well as you know your TV guide. Secondly, Satan knows that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. He never denies that. Thirdly, Satan knows that there is a heaven, there is a hell, there is a judgment day that he's already defeated and his time is short. Satan never confessed Jesus publicly. Have you? Jesus said, if you deny me before men, I will deny you before my Father and his angels which are in heaven. Well, I I joined the church. Joining the church is not confessing Jesus. Church membership is good, but it doesn't save you. You are saved because you accept Jesus and the atonement of the cross. America has become the symbol of a modern Titanic. As a nation, we've been labeled the unsinkable society, the zenith of wealth and culture, but we're racing toward disaster at full speed. As a nation, we have heard the voice of God saying, change course, and we've ignored that voice. We are morally, spiritually, financially, and politically sinking. But here is exactly what happened on the Titanic that's happening now. When the Titanic hit that iceberg and stopped, and then when it started to list, there was a total denial that anything was wrong. Mr. Ismay, the president of the company, said, Don't worry! Everything's all right. This is the unsinkable ship. And the nose is going down. That message was so strong that 24 hours after the Titanic was on the bottom of the ocean, 24 hours after 1,522 people were dead, The headlines in the New York newspaper screamed, quote, all saved from Titanic collision. Telegrams were received saying, all Titanic passengers are safe. Another read, they're being towed into Halifax. The ship was at the bottom of the sea. A total denial of reality. That's what's happening in America right now. People look at what's happening and said, we've always survived in the past. 
Nothing is going to go wrong. Just let the band keep on playing. Let's keep shuffling the deck chairs on the Titanic. It's going to get better. It's not going to get better unless you and you and you and I make it better. And it's going to be made better by standing up and speaking up for righteous principles. Close with this. As was said at the Senate hearings about this great disaster, this tragedy should have never happened because little things mean a lot. I'll give you two of them. One, the Titanic had no red flares. It only had white ones. Red flares were a sign of emergency. We're in trouble. They had lots of white flares. They started shooting them early. And a ship, the Californian, was about nine or ten miles across the water, and they could see them shooting those white sparklers and said, everything's fine over there, and watched them sink. One red flare could have saved 1,522 people. One. Whoever was supposed to bring the binoculars didn't. The guys in the crow's nest were not allowed to use the binoculars because the first officer wanted them. What was he going to do with them? Put them in his room. So the guys in the crow's nest were just using natural eyesight. With those binoculars, they could have seen that iceberg either stopped or had plenty of room to go around it. But instead, the tragedy happened because the little things mean a lot. Do you know what people in eternity are doing right now? People who miss their day of visitation with the Lord and are walking in what the Bible calls total darkness. They're saying things like this. I could have been saved had I prayed one 60-second prayer that Christ would forgive me of my sin. I'm here forever and forever and forever because I refused to change course. I knew I wasn't doing the right thing. I never expected to pass this soon. One prayer and I would have been in heaven today. But I just didn't do it. And some of you fit that description. You've heard the voice of heaven saying, change course, change course. And in your own arrogant pride, you're still plunging straight ahead. Stop today. Hear the voice of heaven and pray that prayer. To receive Jesus Christ, because only then are you safe. Give the Lord praise and heart. Can we stand, bowing your heads in the presence of the Lord as the organist is playing? How many of you in this room can say, Pastor? If the Lord were to come in the next 60 seconds, there's not a doubt in my mind. Not a doubt in my mind. I'm ready to go to heaven. Let me see your hand. Put your hands down. I'm talking to the dozens who couldn't raise your hand. And I want you to hear this very clearly. You'll never have a better opportunity than this day this moment, this hour, to receive Jesus Christ. You're in this room. You say, Pastor, I know I'm going the wrong way. I know I'm doing things I shouldn't do. I know that I'm not ready 
to stand before God and give Him an account of my life. But today, I'd like to pray the sinner's prayer with you in this congregation. I'd like for the angels of God to write my name in the Lamb's Book of Life. I'd like for the blood of Jesus Christ to wash me whiter than snow. If that describes you, let me see your hand right where you are. You're in this building. You want to pray that prayer. Let me see your hand. Raise it high. God bless you. And God bless you and 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 you. Dozens on the lower floor in the balcony. Let me see your hand. God bless you. God bless you. I see you there whole line there. God bless you. God bless you. God bless you. Matthew, I want you to sing this song. And I want every person in this building to join me right here in that one simple, single prayer that will bring you into the haven of rest. That will cause heaven to recognize you as a child of God purchased by the blood of Jesus Christ, I want you to come and make this the greatest day of your life. As they sing, come quickly. I need come. thee, oh. This is the day. This is the day. This is the day. This is the day. that are watching across America and around the world, wherever you are, can join us in this prayer. Sitting at home on your couch, maybe you're in a bar with some of your friends. Whatever the circumstance, God can hear you pray. And from the situation that's beyond belief can send the light of redemption to transform you into becoming a new creature. The tormented life you're living can be left behind. And Christ brings you peace that surpasses understanding. I want you to join us in the prayer that we're praying here. With these precious ones who have come today. And the thousands who have come to Cornerstone Church. That the light of God may go from this place to the nations of the world. Hearing that Jesus can save. Pray this prayer with me all together. Heavenly Father, in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, I ask you to forgive me of all of my sin. Cleanse me from all unrighteousness and make me your child today. May the blood of Jesus Christ wash me and make me white as snow. From this day forward, I will serve the Lord with all of my heart, soul, mind, and body. And now because of the cross, I am saved. Angels are writing my name in the Lamb's book of life. Heaven is my home. Jesus is the Lord of my life. Amen. Give the Lord a shout of praise in the house of God. Bless His name. For the Lord is good, and His mercy endures forever. Amen. Amen.
Raise your hand for the blessing. And now may the Lord bless you. And may the Lord keep you. And may the Lord make His face to shine upon you. And may the Lord be gracious unto you and give you His peace. May you walk in this knowledge that Jesus is the Lord of your life. That you have been saved by the blood of Jesus Christ. A child of God now and forevermore. In Jesus' precious name, walk in that victory. And all of God's children said, praise the Lord. Give the Lord a shout in the house of God. Bless His name. Bless the Lord. Amen.